I've received a lot of comments on both the chick burger and the fencing we've been putting up. Today we're going to go over those comments and questions and see if we can get some answers. Two days ago we built the chick brooder and when that video published I got a lot of feedback on it. Some of it positive and a lot of it constructive criticism of the design which both Ashley and I knew that it, there were some problems with it. So rather than going through the comment section and trying to explain everything out I thought we could address those in this video. And yesterday we got started installing that fence down there, our perimeter fence. And I've received some comments in that video also asking for additional information, just clarifying a few things that were seen in the video. So I'm gonna hope to get those questions answered as well. But before getting into that, I just wanted to let you guys know about the completion of the cattle panel corral. Last week I was making a video about how geometry helped save my fencing project. At the very end, I couldn't find my bolt cutter, so I couldn't put the gate on here. But I got that completed, so check this out. Found my bolt cutters. I'm going to start with the fencing because it looks like it's going to rain soon and the brooder questions I can take under the carport whereas the fencing I need to be outside so I want to do that before it rains. I have my questions and comments right here uh, for the fencing. Scratch Made Homestead said please go into more detail about post spacing and the tying of the wire to the wooden posts at the end of the video. You showed cutting some of the fence and wrapping around the post. Thanks for showing. We'll tackle the fence post spacing first. Right here is a T-post, and I'm gonna pan the camera over, and there you see another T-post, another T-post, and then a wood post way back there. So we have line brace, T-post, 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 wood, T-post, 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 wood. Different types of fencing requires different spacing. For woven wire field fencing, which is what I'm using here, the recommended spacing is 12 to 16 feet. And if you remember from yesterday's video where we're actually doing the fence install, I was talking about how rods are a unit of measurement in fencing. Each rod is 16 and a half feet. So instead of using the 16 foot spacings, we decided to do one fence post every rod, which so our spacing is 16 and a half feet between each post. It's a little bit wider than the recommended spacing, but I'm not too worried about a half a foot, especially because I'm using these wood posts as every fourth post. Which reminds me, we got another question from Mike Barnes who asked why we are using a wood post in between the T-posts. The reason we're using wood posts in between the T-posts is to add a lot more strength to the fence. The T-posts do a good job, but having the wood in there every fourth post just adds a lot of strength and stability to the whole system and gives me more confidence with that wider spacing. For the second half of Scratch Made Homestead's question regarding tying the ends of the fencing around the post, I brought, I brought this thing out here for illustration purposes. This was our fence stretching tool right here. It's basically it's basically two two by fours. These are not quite two by fours. They're rough cut lumber, but they're bolted together with a four inch bolt, a nut and washer. And sandwiched between them is the end of the fencing here. The cable, a cable was tied around this, which was attached to a come along. And the come along was attached to my tail hitch and the come along is ratcheted. So it was just ratcheted tight. Actually, it, it, looked like this, 
and this was just this was just the extra fence hanging off the end and it was being pulled this way thus tightening the fence but I'm gonna flip this back around this way and, and use this for demonstration purposes uh, let's pretend that this isn't cut yet what we did when the fence was pulled out here before it was tied to the post we started in the center and cut these pieces here and then cut the verticals as well so we were left with just a single strand going across so with with the piece of fencing loose from both here here and on this end we were able to pull the strand of fencing around and then coil it back on itself on this side of the post. We started in the middle of that and worked our way outward and that process was repeated all the way till we got the top and bottom down there. The top and the bottom of the fence, the, the wire is a heavier gauge. So those are the wires we cut last because they were able to hold that tension longer by themselves. If we had cut them first and worked our way down, it'd be more likely that by the time we got toward the bottom that the weaker uh, links in the middle would not be able to hold that tension that was being put on it by the come along. Lilac City Real Estate wrote, perhaps you could share how you came to choose this fence style and what other options you eliminated and why. Again, this is field fencing. That's what this material here is called. It's woven wire. Some of the other fencing options are high tensile wire, barbed wire, electric poly wire. Of course, there's wooden post and rail fencing and probably some others that I'm omitting here. The number one reason I got the field fencing though is because the lady who was my mentor for a long time prior to me even getting sheep, uh, her name is Melissa, she told me get field fencing. This is what she used and this is what she recommends all of the people that she teaches use. She taught me so many other things about getting started with farming that I just thought it would be I just thought it would be a good idea to follow her recommendation and just get the field fencing. But why would she recommend field fencing? Mainly because she is a shepherd and this is really good fencing for sheep because there are vertical strands on this. This is electric poly wire fencing here and this would be similar to how high tensile wire would be. Of course it would be really thick strong strands of metal but Essentially, this is less ideal for perimeter fencing for sheep. Sheep, in some cases, depending on the levels of the strands, can either go under or through or over the wires. This field fencing is 47 inches tall, and since it has the vertical strands on it, there's no way any sheep can go through it. Also, barbed wire is not recommended for sheep. It's not very effective on them, and the barbs just tend to get wool all over them. But if you're trying to fence cattle or other livestock, your fencing requirements might be completely different. But what is true is that if you can fence for sheep, the sheep fencing is also good for cattle or pigs, other livestock. And now for the brooder feedback. I broke it down into different categories. The first is regarding putting a door on here. Mary Goodwin writes, is it possible to make an access door on the side of the brooder so you don't have to hang over the sides when doing things? The Hall Hobby Farm writes, looks good. It'd be nice if it had a little door across one of the bottoms for clean out. Mate to Freer writes, best to cut out the defect of wire. I think what should be done on one side is to make a door down at the bottom that could be opened to clean out the litter and some doors to open on the front as the top isn't going to be fun to reach in. Toward the end of building this, Ashley and I talked about actually trying to put in a door. We were wondering if that would be a good idea or not. Ashley wanted to leave this portion of the hardware cloth on here so uh, we could get our hands on it easily without it hurting. The ends of the hardware cloth are really sharp so that being curled over here gives us a good handle and she recommended just popping out the staples, peeling the hardware cloth back and just getting in there and scraping it all out. The area of defect you heard the commenter referring to is this right here. For some reason in the hardware cloth the vertical runs on here were not put into manufacturing. 
But I think actually installing a door on the sides of this thing would be a lot better. It'd be a lot easier if you just open and close it without popping staples and having to restaple and all that. It is a good idea and it is something that we are definitely looking at doing. Next up are comments regarding the flooring. Belt King had commented letting me know that he uses a vinyl sheeting on the floor which makes up cleanup which makes cleanup really easy. He goes on to say that he has a lot of concerns that you will regret not putting two by four cross members down the center to support the one by twelves be to prevent warping or bowing. So he's talking about installing a two by four to run across underneath these one by twelves right here. Another good suggestion that is something that we should do. Ashley and I were walking on the one by twelves as we were building this thing and if we were to step in the middle it would definitely you would definitely feel it kind of come in a little bit but on the outsides I felt really strong and it was supporting both of our weight and the chicks the chicks plus waterer feed and pine star are definitely not going to weigh as much uh, so it wasn't a real priority it wasn't a high priority or a real strong concern for us during the build we didn't have that in the plans at the time it wasn't something we thought would be an issue but it would be a good idea to add it it definitely wouldn't hurt anything and it would give it a lot more strength and it wouldn't be hard to add so that's again something else we're looking at adding i got a few comments about the gap in the floor right here Hyde Enterprises writes, it looks like there's quite a gap in between the floor and the end vertical board. Eliza Johnson says, I'm a little confused by the gaps on the end. Wouldn't chicks fall through that? The gap at the end there is certainly not intentional. These boards, when we were when we were working with these boards, we were we assumed that it was like any other dimensional lumber. A 12 inch board is actually 11 and a half inches. Well, it turns out these were 11 and a quarter inch we should have measured that beforehand so when we started laying them down we realized that those that little quarter inch on each board kind of added up to fix that we can just screw a two by four to that beam down there going across and it would cover that gap regarding the sides of the brooder and the hardware cloth onita's in rides you might want to shore up that weak area of wire missing from the cloth Chris Young writes, I would consider using tin as side covering. Chicks will tear up any plastic materials unless the plastic is offset from the wire. Also you'll find that shaving also you'll find that the shavings will go through the wire quite easily and make quite a mess. Liz Zorab writes, we used silver foil backed bubble wrap around our brooder held on with washing pins. When Ashley and I originally sat down to design this, we had designed this with 1x12s going across for the walls all the way around this thing. But then when we got to the hardware store and saw how expensive the 1x12s were, we changed our mind. It was pretty expensive. So standing there in the hardware store, having half our wood already loaded and trying to figure out how we were gonna build this thing just on the fly, I thought, hey, we can put up hardware cloth and wrap it in polyfilm to keep the wind out and that should be good enough. And the polyfilm will also hold in the pine shavings. But Chris Young brings up a good point with the chicks being able to peck through the polyfilm and rip it down and or eat it those aren't things i want them to do i didn't consider that happening so uh, he's pointing out that that's probably not a great idea if i put furring strips here and had the plastic offset then the plastic would not be able to hold in the pine shaving so that probably wouldn't work either what we'll probably wind up doing is get some dimensional lumber perhaps a couple two by twelves and stack them on their sides and run them across as the walls there to hold in that deep litter. There were some comments about being able to reach into the brooder. Don Wise writes, nice brooder, but do you think you'll have any issue with trying to reach in with it being so tall? Do you plan to use a step stool? Ashley had the same concern too as we were building it. She said, I'm gonna have to get a step stool or something to be able to get in there. But something to keep in mind is, we're gonna be using 18 inches of deep litter. From the top of the brooder to the floor is three feet. And 18 inches is going to be somewhere in this area right here. So actually, it's not going to be that far of a reach down. And Cootie had several questions. Number one, how are you going to clean it out? I had a couple different thoughts on this. One is we were thinking originally that we would peel off the hardware cloth in that corner and just scrape it out with a hoe or uh, a rake, whatever we can get in there. Another thought would be just to turn it on its side and dump it out. 
Number two was the brooder designed with multiple potential future uses in mind, as in for turkeys or rabbits or anything like that. When we were designing it, we didn't think of those things. But when we were building it, I was thinking, we can use this for other stuff like if we if we needed to quarantine a chicken for some reason if somebody was sick and we needed to put them in there we could definitely do that so though we did not consider that during the design we're definitely open to the possibility of using it for other things in the future number three and cootie recommends putting on corner or diagonal braces to reduce any flex in the structure if we try to move it good advice we'll definitely look at adding that number four if you plan to use heat lamps I wonder if you could use some reflective material rather than translucent polyfilm. Uh, Liz Zorab, of course, referred to that earlier when she was talking about a reflective bubble film. We'll definitely look into that as well for heat retention purposes, so thank you for that comment. And Kuti also asked if we watch John Siskovic's channel. He has a lot of great stuff there for pasture poultry production. Yes, I do subscribe to John Siskovic's channel. He has a lot of great content. I try to watch it when I can. In fact, about a week ago, I bought his book on building chicken tractors using his designs. So I purchased that. I haven't gone through that yet. But in the next couple weeks, we're going to be looking at building chicken tractors for the broilers. And I'm 95% sure I'm going to be using his design that he has in his book. Daniel Gardner asks, is this thing going to be outside? Yes, we don't have any space inside of our house. Initially, we were thinking about using just a plastic tote for brooding the chickens in, but we don't have any space inside our house. We don't have any outbuildings or heated shops, anything like that. So it's just going to be under this open carport. Thank you everyone who took the time to write in to let me know what you thought about this project. It really means a lot to me that you guys take a few minutes to give your thoughts, your constructive criticism. It lets me know that you guys really care about what's going on here. That means a lot to me. And it's also very helpful because we're taking this feedback and we're going to be implementing some of these ideas because of you guys. So thanks a lot.